lucky today to um, have all these people in from out of town. Emily Rapp, and Rob Robert, and Gina Frangello. So uh, one of our readers, though, got ill. There's kind of there's a bug going around, and she couldn't make it. And so I thought I would read a little something, uh, which I haven't done in a long time, uh, actually. But uh, I'm directing a movie next year based on my novel, Happy Baby, and the Rumpus is producing it. And so I thought I'd just read a little tiny little section of that. Um, I'm going to start right in the middle, so there's no context. Yeah. And uh, I'll just say that uh, if you were reading, you would see that Theo is 22 and Mr. Gracie is 45. That's all I'm going to say. Interior, uh, interior bus, night. The noise of the bus is overwhelming. At first, Mr. Gracie has his newspaper open. Theo sits right across from him with his hand over his jacket pocket. Mr. Gracie puts his paper down on the seat next to him. It unrolls to the classified, and they look each other in the eye. So, this is Mr. Gracie. So, what's on your mind? I'm glad, this is Theo. I guess it'll be obvious. I'll just let it be obvious. <laughs> I'm glad you're not working there anymore. You're a predator. A predator? In a set of close-ups, Mr. Gracie takes a cigarette from his pocket and slides the window open. The bus driver into the rearview mirror. No smoking on the bus. There are only eight or nine people on the bus. The streets they ride past are desolate, closed down factories, hot dog stands, broken windows. This is an area of metropolitan Detroit in decay, returning to nature. Mr. Gracie, terrible to work so hard all day and step out into this kind of heat. I've always worked hard for less than I'm worth. Theo looks away but catches himself and turns back. You know what you did. Mr. Gracie sizes Theo up, squinting his eyes, narrowing in on Theo. No, I don't know. What did I do? Maybe you can enlighten me. How did you lose your job, Theo says. Did you get caught? Caught at what? Caught taking a break? I saw you in the window the other day. You think I didn't know you were following me? I don't walk through the world blind. My wife wanted to call the police, but I told her not to worry. Said you were just working some things out. Was I right about that? Theo moves closer, tries to build up courage. Theo, yeah, I'm working things out right here, Mr. Gracie. I met my wife in high school, high school sweetheart. How's that for the American dream? You have a girlfriend? Theo, what do you care about anyone? Mr. Gracie, tell me. Theo, in the Price home when I was in Stevenson House. Mr. Gracie, Stevenson House, that's where they sent you? Mr. Gracie ponders the Stevenson House for boys, decides it's the right place. There's worse places, you know. A Stevenson boy and a Price girl? Why not? Theo, I shouldn't even have been there. Mr. Gracie, but you were. All right. There are better places, too. There are better ways to become a man. What do you think you're going to do now that we're talking? You got a gun in your pocket? You got something for me? Theo looks away from Mr. Gracie. Theo looks down at the floor. He shakes his head. Mr. Gracie, you think you can take care of that price girl? Theo, you don't know anything. You're monsters, all of you. Flashback, interior office night, still the sound of the bus moving, but as, it's, as if it were going into a tunnel, then emerging, we see the dull yellow paint and strip of metal at the end of an office shelf, the end of a dark green desk that is shaking. A child's fingers come into view. End flashback, interior bus, continuous, the polished metal floor of the bus. They ride in silence for a while. It's hard to know. Um, what great Mr. Gracie has said and what Theo has heard, but something in Theo is broken. Mr. Gracie, that's a big city out there. Eat a man alive. Theo, looking off, talking both to himself and Mr. Gracie, I promised her. Mr. Gracie, when I first started at Western a long time ago, before you were there, there was a boy named Michael. Michael had boils on his face the size of gumballs. He wasn't good at sports, 
and he wasn't smart. And the other kids beat him down in the showers. The thing was, given the chance, he would participate in beating down another young buck. In other words, you couldn't say he didn't deserve it. He had no family, and the state didn't know what to do with him. He had no talent, and no strength, and no character. I can remember him like a photograph. Every time I found him face down on the tile with broken teeth, his blood meandering toward the drain, and I realized, watching this poor kid, that some people have nothing. What do you think that means? Theo, I don't know. Mr. Gracie, it means if someone has nothing, then someone else must have everything. It's not fair. He stops. You don't have to worry about that. You have things going for you. You're a survivor. That's why I chose you. Mr. Gracie stands up. Theo looks up at him. Mr. Gracie, somebody should have taken you home. You know? Theo starts to stand. Wait, Mr. Gracie, no. Mr. Gracie places his hand over Theo's face, his palm resting on Theo's jaw, his fingers across Theo's eyes and forehead, keeping him seated. Mr. Gracie, do this for me. Get a haircut. Clean yourself up a little. Wear nicer clothes. Think about your appearance. You're a good-looking guy. Make something out of it. Mr. Gracie starts to move his hand, but Theo presses against it, pushing into his palm. Mr. Gracie, don't follow me anymore, Theo. I can't take care of you. I have my own family. Go home. Take care of your girl. Theo, I can't. Mr. Gracie, then take care of yourself. Remember, I kept you safe. You were safe when I was around. None of those boys did anything to you when I was there. You know why I kept you safe, right? Theo nods his head. Mr. Gracie, that's right. But you're on your own now. Mr. Gracie pulls his hand away, slaps Theo's leg with the rolled newspaper. The bus door opens, discharging a loud metallic sound. Mr. Gracie steps out into the street and we're left with Theo. The driver stares at him in the rearview mirror as the bus door closes. We can hear the sound of boots in a hallway coming closer. Interior, Theo's apartment, night. The orange glow of the street lights filter in around the drawn window shade as Theo steps into the apartment. The sound of Maria's breath fills the room. Theo steps close to her. He's standing over her, and as he adjusts to the light, he can see her eyes are open, and she's looking at him. He sees the makeup and the dark bruise, the shape of a handprint on her shoulder. Theo, so that's it then. You're leaving me. He takes his clothes off, folds them carefully into the milk crates, hangs his jacket in the closet. He's being very methodical. Theo runs the water in the bathroom, waiting for it to get hot, then soaks a towel. He lathers with soap and shaves carefully. When he's done, he looks at himself in the mirror, then pulls the blade from the razor and makes a tiny cut on his shoulder. Then he cuts himself three more times. He runs his fingers over the wound, pressing on it to make it hurt. His mouth opens as if he were trying to swallow the world. His eyes close. He leans forward against the mirror. Theo climbs into the mattress with Maria. Maria, did you do it? Theo, we talked. Maria turns to him. That's not what you said you were going to do. Theo, I wanted to. Maria, you're a coward. He turn, she turns away, disgusted, hurt, tucks her hands beneath her head. Theo grabs a handful of hair and pulls viciously. Don't you turn away from me. Maria lets out a gasp and carefully backs her body toward him. Fade out. Thank you.